Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Bonnie Henry, the Provincial Health Officer for British Columbia, and I want to start by acknowledging that we are on the traditional and unceded territories of the Lokungan speaking peoples, particularly the Esquimalt and the Songhees First Nation, and we're very grateful to be able to um, be here on these traditional lands today. Um, today's update on COVID-19 here in BC. We have 29 new cases who have tested positive in British Columbia today for a total of 1,203 people who have tested positive for the disease in our province. That includes 554 people in Vancouver Coastal Health, uh, 424 in the Fraser Health Region, 76 on Vancouver Island Health Region, 128 people in Interior Health, and 21 people in the Northern Health Region. In addition, we've got one more long-term care facility outbreak um, in the uh, Fraser Health region, which uh, leaves us with 23 outbreaks now in long-term care. Um, as I have mentioned, you know, this is an area of particular focus that we have been working on, particularly the long-term care homes in the, in the Lower Mainland, where we know we've had two very serious uh, outbreaks that continue. And it has been um, most of the rest of them we've been able to uh, manage with just a single case being detected and a full outbreak response has taken place. So um, for most of these outbreaks, catching it early has made the huge difference in protecting the people in that facility. Um, we have uh, 149 people who are hospitalized with COVID-19 in BC today, including 68 people who are in ICU or critical care units. We have an additional three deaths to report today as well. And as always, um, we recognize that this number represents um, people who are dear to their family, to their friends, and who will be missed. And our condolences go out to them. We now have 704 people, though, who are fully recovered from COVID-19, which is also a very positive thing. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit and give you an idea about some of the important research uh, efforts that are going on to help support both our response now on the ground here for COVID-19 and to ensure that we have the best possible information uh, that contributes to the worldwide understanding about this disease and how it can be treated, how it can be managed, and our connections to um, important research that's being done around the world. So we have established a COVID-19 Strategic Research Advisory Committee um, that is being led. The initiatives have been led from very early on by Dr. David Patrick, who's one of our colleagues and uh, a physician um, epidemiologist who works at the BC Centre for Disease Control and at UBC. And he has been the lead in developing our research and innovation program from early January when we put our, our response team together. And he's got a... Um, a group of scientists and researchers and medical professionals from around the province who are working on this and I'm very grateful for all of the, the work that they put into this and on our research advisory committee as well are a number of public health experts including uh, my predecessor Dr. Perry Kendall who we've um, brought back in to, to provide advice at this critical time. So this advisory committee is going to facilitate the ongoing uh, research uh, um, here in BC that will contribute to our understanding and knowledge, also contribute to the information that uh, we get on a daily basis to help us understand how we're doing. So things like the modeling that we've presented here. We've also uh, uh, allocated at least $2 million in funding to the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. And the foundation has been working um, from early January to uh, with the BC CDC on four specific things that we've been uh, tracking already. One of those is tracking transmission of the virus in British Columbia, and that is contributing to the modeling that we've presented, as well as the, the more dynamic modeling, a more detailed model that we'll be talking about in the coming weeks. We uh, have a research project that is underway to understand the baseline susceptibility of people in British Columbia to COVID-19 and that will allow us as 
I've talked about before when we have a serologic test that helps us understand who has been infected and who's immune to this disease. So we needed to put the building box in, blocks in place prior to the, the virus coming to BC to, to be able to do that in a systematic way. And some of the researchers at BCCDC, particularly Dr. Danuta Skaronsky and Dr. Mel Krajden, have been working on this for some time with the support of the Michael Smith Foundation. We're also um, being supported a, a, an initiative to develop a vaccine for COVID-19, and, and there are at least 25 vaccine initiatives around the world, and we are part of that through Dr. Srin Murthy and his team and uh, the funding that we've got through Michael Smith. And one of the other really interesting things that we're working on is understanding how the infodemic, it's being called by many people, um, but the, the myriad of information that is out there on social media, on other platforms, and how that impacts people's behaviors um, through this uh, pandemic. And that's one of the other key things that we're working on. The, the first research call that the Michael Smith Foundation is doing, um, it is in, aligned as well with uh, a number of research initiatives that have been underway from the Canadian Institute for Health Research, our health authorities, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and many more partnerships. Um, the first call we're looking at are things like the rapid evaluation of the public health countermeasures. How well are we doing um, with the things that we have put in place, like travel restrictions, uh, like the, uh, the cancelling of in-classroom schools, uh, in-classroom teaching in schools, like the distancing measures that we have been putting in place across society and understanding which of these measures works in which scenarios and how well they work. We also have a lot of um, BC-specific population epidemi epidemiologic information that helps us um, determine how we're doing in our case and contact investigations and um, how we're doing in specific populations around the province. So all of these are, are really ways to bring the brightest minds and researchers that we have across BC together and to link them with our colleagues around the world and across the country. And I just want to say this is really an important part of our toolkit to help us get through this first wave of COVID-19 and to help ensure that we know what to do and how we can do it um, as this pandemic progresses and whether we have second waves or and uh, everything that we can do between now and having treatment and having a vaccine for this virus. So I want to thank everybody that's been involved in these research projects and, and the ones to come, and the Michael Smith Foundation in particular. Um, I know we are working with all of the universities across British Columbia, and uh, I think this is going to be a, an important part of helping us get through this and know what to do um, for the future. Finally, I just want to reiterate what I talked about yesterday that the risk remains very high for us right now in British Columbia. We are in the thick of it, and we must hold our line. This is our time to be unwavering in our commitment um, to keep our firewall strong, to keep our distance um, between us, our physical distance, that safe distance between us that doesn't allow this virus to spread but also to, to ensure that we're taking those measures to, to keep socially connected, to support each other in our families, in our communities, so that we can get through this together. And I know people have gone to extraordinary efforts and made many sacrifices, all of us, across this province to protect our families, particularly to protect our elders and our seniors and our health care workers. And all of us must continue every day to do those important things that prevent transmission of this virus. Things, the motherhood things that I talk about all the time, washing our hands regularly, staying home as much as possible right now, if we can, um, staying apart with our physical distancing while staying connected. Um, in particular, we want to talk about the importance of self-isolating, staying away from others if you are sick, or if you are a traveler, because we know that there are risks and people who are coming back into this country who have traveled. And travelers, as we know, there's a quarant federal quarantine order now. That you must immediately self-isolate for 14 days from the moment you arrive here in British Columbia, whether it's at, at the airport or a land border, and without question and without exception. 
And we, as a community, will support you in doing that. So if you have a loved one, a community member who's coming home, do what you need to do to support them. And that may mean buying groceries for them and dropping them off, making sure that they have a way to get home from the airport without having to take pub public transit, having frequent virtual visits. We need as a community to support people to do this, um, sharing books and videos. You know, we need to be united, all of us, in stopping the transmission of this virus now. So join us. If you have family or friends who are coming back, we've all made this sacrifice in BC and it is helping us. It is helping us keep this manageable so that everybody who needs the care that they in our healthcare system gets what they need. This is our time where we need to keep our firewall strong. We all need can stand proud knowing that we're doing our bit and that we are holding the line for our families and our communities here in BC. And I'm happy to take questions. Okay, before we move into questions, reminder to, to enter the queue, you are limited to one question. And we ask that everybody please take your phones off of mute. You will not be audible until we call your name. So our first question this morning, or this afternoon, sorry, comes from Vaughn Palmer with the Vancouver Sun. Go ahead. Good day, Dr. Henry. Uh, these flights that the national government is organizing to bring Canadians home from the United States and from overseas, are you being informed in advance of the arrival of those flights and the arrangements being made to quarantine people? Uh, are you satisfied with those arrangements? And are any of them scheduled to arrive in British Columbia over the next few days? Uh, the short answer is yes, and we've been working very much with the, the federal government, so we know that there was uh, people who were uh, repatriated from a cruise ship uh, off Florida um, just yesterday, and a number of those people uh, returned here to British Columbia. We were a part of the um, understanding of what was happening. Uh, these people flew, all flew into uh, Toronto and were assessed, and uh, quarantine was available there. Uh, people who had no symptoms and had a, um, an adequate place where they could self-isolate and quarantine at home were allowed to uh, return to British Columbia and we have been in contact with uh, our federal counterparts about being notified about all of those people so that is in place. There are uh, repatriation flights that are being arranged particularly from a number of uh, countries like India and we are aware that some are arriving uh, in the coming days and we have been working very closely with the Public Health Agency of Canada, with the Canadian Border Services Agency, uh, around what will happen for those people in particular. Um, and I think it's safe to say we, were, we had some concerns that uh, the strength of the response at all of the airports and land border crossings were not at the area, that, uh, not strong enough that we um, yet and so we want to look at how we can support uh, the federal agencies in making sure that everybody is aware of the uh, the requirements when they come back and this is one of the things that I've been talking about how we as a community need to support those people things are very different from when many people left the country um, particularly we know that many people have gone to India and other places um, to visit family and friends that's a very common thing that happens and there has been rapid changes as we all know in the last few weeks so yes we want to work with our federal counterparts to make sure that we put everything in place to support people to do what we need them to do which is to maintain that isolation for 14 days once they come back um, the other thing that I think is really important is we want to we want people who are coming back to know that we are here to support them as well and we know that a certain proportion of people will develop this disease while they're in quarantine and they need to know that we're here um, the, how to connect with us to get the medical support that they need as well so we're putting all of that in place um, and we're working very um, closely with our federal counterparts on that Next question is from Keith Baldry. 
Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Henry. I suddenly received a whole bunch of emails on one subject. We all get emails asking us to ask you a particular question, but suddenly people want to know, at this point in the outbreak, in the pandemic, is it advisable, and I guess this is because kids are no longer in school, is it advisable to have your grandparents look after young people right now? Yeah, that's a very challenging question. Um, we know that uh, that older people are more susceptible um, to this virus or to having serious disease. What is important, though, is the number of connections that you're having. So we know that the physical distance can make a difference. So if you are, um, your kids are only having connections with their grandparents and not with multiple other families, then the risk is is much lower. And we know that there's many healthy um, grandparents out there that are perfectly fine and will be able to look after the kids and, and um, may not be at as high risk. So I think the important thing from my perspective is making sure we're protecting people that are more vulnerable to having the ser serious illness and then making sure we're not having multiple connections that could introduce the virus into our family and then to our grandparents and, and others who are caring for our children. Next question is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, there's mounting evidence that COVID is being spread by people who are asymptomatic. Uh, uh, Dr. Teresa Tam uh, talked this week about how they're looking at the evolving science. I know initially you had said we didn't believe that it was uh, spread when there were uh, no symptoms, but wondering your latest thoughts on that and if yours personally have changed. Yeah, so I think I've always said that that's not the major driver of this. And we have um, increasingly um, case reports of um, potential asymptomatic spread, but I, the literature has not changed that much. And we've been looking at this very carefully, and uh, Dr. Tam is, you know, we've um, consolidated that literature and have had multiple discussions about this. And my, my advice and my understanding of this has not changed. It is that the vast majority of transmission happens when people are um, even mildly ill. We do know that this virus is shed in, in high amounts by some people um, early on in illness. So it's those early symptoms that can be, um, people may not notice, they can be subtle, particularly in young healthy people. So whether whether it's asymptomatic or right around the time that you're developing your symptoms, we need to be cautious about that. And that's why it's so important to do things like keeping our physical distance, uh, a safe distance, like covering our mouth when we cough so th those droplets don't get out there. Um, the vast majority of transmission we know happens when people are sick. Next question is from Kathy Smith, Fort Nelson News. Go ahead. Hello, Dr. Henry. Um, there's been some talk of being able to flatten the curve by summertime with another wave of COVID coming in the fall. Can you explain why the fall might be predicted and if this information is actually valid? Yeah, I, I think the, the short answer is we don't really know, but there are some um, some theories that are based on things that have happened with other respiratory viruses, and particularly what we know about influenza, what we know about other coronaviruses that do circulate in the human populations, and there's four of them that we see pretty regularly. So what we're hoping is that, yes, this wave um, will subside with all of the measures that we're taking globally now um, to reduce the transmission, and certainly here in BC, that's what we're aiming for. What we do know is that this, uh, you know, there's some evidence that cor this coronavirus is behaving like other coronaviruses, which means that when we have increased light, uh, UV light and warmer temperatures, it tends to fade away. So that's what we see with influenza, for example, every year. We see there's a season where we see more influenza and then it tends to go away for us in the Northern Hemisphere in the summer and then we see emergence again in the fall. So that's where this comes from, the concern that during our respiratory season, um, the next fall, that we'll start to see it increasing naturally again, even if um, the, the measures that we've taken are in place. So we need to uh, we need to watch that carefully. We don't know for sure how this virus is going to behave, but that's what other respiratory viruses do on a cyclical basis. The, the, the one caveat to that is when a new virus is introduced into a, a human population for which we have no immunity, 
it may not fade away um, in the ways that we would see once it's been circulating for a while. So we need to watch this very carefully. And I've said from the beginning that you know one of the things that we've been aiming to do in British Columbia and across Canada is, is flatten the curve and buy us time. Buy us time so that the closer we get to summer, we can take more advantage of the, the natural waning uh, of disease and hope that this will work as well for, for this coronavirus. Next, we have Les Lane from the Times Colonist. Oh, thanks, Doctor. Uh, the uh, percentage increase over the last couple of weeks has been declining. I, I make it about 2% now, today's hike, 29 new cases. You were um, concerned of about 10, 12 days ago, I think there was an increase there of 20 per 20% or more for a few days, and then it chopped it down to 10, 12. Now we're at two. Are you generally, I mean, are you counting a 2% increase today as, as a win? Ah, I don't think I'm ready to say anything is a win yet, but every day that we have been bending that curve is a good thing. There are many things that are out of our control that can happen, and this is why we're, we're making such a big deal about people who are coming into the country right now, because we are holding our own here um, right now. We're still doing aggressive testing and, and contact tracing in the community. You know, we've had outbreaks happen in, in many different places. We're continuing to see introductions into our long-term care homes. So this could um, take a turn um, for the worse for us in the in the coming week, in particular. But I am heartened that we are seeing that that decrease in acceleration. Um, if we had continued to see that 24, 25 percent increase, um, we would have had many, many more cases, and that's very concerning. Um, we have more data points now than when I presented a, a week ago. Um, our epi curve and, and some of the modeling. So we are seeming to flatten our curve. And that's why it is so, so important that we continue to do, as I've been saying, hold the line so that we can continue to provide the needed health care for those who, who need it both for COVID-19 but also for those other things that are affecting people in our communities right now. Fran Yanor from The GOAT. Oh, hi, Dr. Henry. Um, and my question is about the uh, under 40 demographic. I, it, they make up about a third of the cases federally, uh, almost a third provincially, not an insignificant hospitalization rate in other jurisdictions. Um, I just wondered, uh, one Canadian health expert suggested they are at risk but might underestimate the dangers, particularly the 18 to 30 set. Can you speak to what you are seeing in terms of the risk profile and, and the rest of your work related to this? Yeah, so we have um, published our, uh, it's on the BCCDC website, the age profile of the cases that we have. And we do have a spike in the sort of uh, late 20s to early 40s range. Um, but that reflects as well that many of our cases are healthcare workers. And so healthcare workers tend to be in that age group, they tend to be more women than men. And that is reflected in the demographics of the, uh, that, that we're seeing of people who are positive for this virus. And uh, we have been thankfully uh, lucky, if you will, in that we've had very few hospitalizations um, and, and no deaths in that age group. So that is important for us. Um, having said that, we know that across the country there have been young people and around the world there have been young people who have been affected by this and, and young physicians, young um, healthcare workers. Um, so it, it, young people are not immune to this. We, as well as uh, around the world, are seeing very little disease in people under the age of 19. Um, we've had a single hospitalization, no serious illness in, in um, people under the age of 19, and that's reassuring for all of us. But it's, uh, you know, the p young people are not immune. And, and that 20 to 30 to 40 year old age group, um, there are people who have had severe illness in that age group. And w that's why we all need to take the measures to be careful. Next question comes from Ben Miljur from CTV. Go ahead, please. 
Uh, hello, Doctor. Um, in speaking with somebody who works on the downtown east side, they have described the biggest need as individual rooms for people to shelter and self-isolate in. They suggest that hotel rooms are the best option for that, with staff hired and trained to provide supports. Is that something that uh, you would uh, advise the province would be a good idea to do uh, uh, going forward to provide shelter for people living outside? Yeah, I think all of us would like to provide shelter for people who are living outside. I know there's a very um, intense program, in, particularly for the downtown east side. I know here in Victoria as well, um, there's a, a phased-in program to look at how we can best um, support and protect people who are living on the street. And housing is certainly a very important part of that. Um, it's not a simple um, way of, uh, it, all of these things are not simple, of course, and it's complex in trying to find the right supports for the right people at the right time and being able to do that in a way that um, that's allows them to continue to uh, receive the medications they need and other things. But I know there's a lot of work going on with that and I do support absolutely. Um, we've seen that around the world, the Housing First um, initiatives and and you know this is reflective not only of this crisis but of the crises that we have been dealing with for the last few years, which is uh, the overdose crisis and we ha we saw a spike in overdose deaths in the downtown east side, um, so we need to make sure that we are doing everything we can to support people um, for both of these issues because they are absolutely interrelated. Lauren Collins, Serena leader. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, my question is on the hospital numbers. Are there significant numbers of suspected but not confirmed COVID-19 patients within BC hospitals? And I know it's early, but when and if the hospitalization numbers level out, when do you look to start taking measures to use some of that ex excess capacity for reasons other than COVID-19? Yeah, a very good question. Um, so there are uh, people coming into hospital every day, as we know. Um, the testing is very rapid now. We have a, a you know 24-hour turnaround, so there are not large numbers of people um, that I'm aware of. But what we present are the hospitalization numbers as of seven o'clock this morning. Um, so yes, there are people um, being assessed even as we speak um, and being tested. Uh, so. You know, I can't give you an, an idea of how many they are, and that's one of the reasons why we've always been um, giving the numbers at a specific point in every day. Um, that's our best way of, of telling you how we're progressing, um, because we know that it changes from minute to minute. And you know, between um, people being in the hospital, going into the ICU, coming back into a hospital room, being discharged, you know, there's it's in flux all the time. Um, I, there's not a large backlog of people waiting for tests, if that's what you're asking at the moment. We've, uh, we've managed to get it so that it's quite rapid. Um, in terms of when do we, when do we look at, uh, in particular, you know, scheduling surgeries again and those things. Um, I'm obviously, right now, we're in the, the thick of things. This is the two-week period um, where we will see the, the benefit and the impact of all of these measures that we've been doing across the uh, province to try and stop these transmission chains. So come next week after the Easter weekend, we'll have a much better idea of where we are. And we've been thinking already and, and looking at what is a strategy for how we will um, ramp up some of the health care needs and make sure that we're meeting the needs of people who have been um, not had access to um, hospital care if they need it. So yes, we are planning already, but uh, the timing will depend on what happens in the next 10 days. Okay, Shrushti Gangdev, CKNW. Uh, hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, you say that you mentioned overdose calls as another priority for the province and obviously they are uh, people who are more vulnerable to, to overdoses are already the subject of another public health crisis in this province but um, I'm hearing that a public health order has been issued to tell firefighters not to respond to medical emergency calls unless they're color-coded purple and many overdose calls come in color-coded red when they're actually quite life-threatening or lead to lifelong injuries and fire crews are often the first people on the scene to provide that immediate life-saving support. 
So from what I'm hearing from fire officials, uh, they're saying there's a quote gap in the modification of that order and it's going to specifically disproportionately affect that population that's already vulnerable. What do you have to say to that? Yeah, so it's not a, it's not an order. It came out of our, um, our, our discussions at the Emergency Operations Centre and it reflects actually the reality on the ground that uh, fire services were not wanting to respond to health uh, calls because of concerns about um, being uh, exposed to COVID-19. And it was discussions with uh, the paramedics, the BCEHS, as well as um, the fire services that this came about. This this is not a new thing. We have done this before um, in the pandemic, for example, an H1N1 pandemic in 2009. And it reflects uh, the reality on the ground that we want the paramedics to be available for uh, for these calls, and we want to ensure that uh, everybody who's at the calls that are needed have the um, the personal protective equipment they need. So it's a way of protecting our our other first responders, including police and fire. And the the 911 dispatch um, has a protocol for how they dispatch either paramedics, police or fire and ambulance and it's automatically, um, in, in most occasions, it's automatically fire and ambulance service who are dispatched at the same time. So this is a way of ensuring that the paramedics are the first dispatched to, um, to medical calls. Uh, I will also say, and we've said that a number of times, that the paramedic um, call numbers are going down because people aren't out as much. There's not as much um, transfer of people as well as things like um, car crashes, for example. So this was a way to best protect our first responders and ensure that um, people got the paramedic response that they needed. And um, my, uh, um, my understanding from discussions with our BCEHS and the fire service is that there is also a, a, a paramedic station um, in the downtown east side and that response times are, are um, being managed right now in the way to try and best protect everybody. So we have one more, t uh, one <laughs> more question today. Um, for any reporters that didn't get to ask a question, there will be a statement released this afternoon. For recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the Provincial Health Officer's orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. Last question today is from Nick Johansson from Castanet. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Henry. Are you able to provide any update on the outbreak at uh, Okanagan Correctional Centre? Uh, have there been any more positive cases there? And how many tests have been administered at the Correctional Centre? Uh, there are no additional positive cases yet at the at the centre. I know they are monitoring the health um, status of all of the um, people who potentially were exposed, both uh, workers and other inmates. Um, I don't have a number for the number of tests that have been done, uh, but I know there are no additional positives at this point. Okay, and that's all the time we have Thank today. You Thank you for much. participating.